some virtual guests here. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, our topic today is possible terrorist threats, facts, myth and reality. I am Nicole Britz, the uh, chairwoman of the Bavarian Pirate Party. I'm your host for this panel discussion and I'd like to introduce you to my guests. You probably already know them. So because the list has changed a bit. Okay, this is uh, Dr. Uh, Rob Imre. He's an interdisciplinary researcher, especially when it comes to topics like terrorism, education systems, and changes in the interaction between governments and societies. And I'd like to welcome Mr. Peter Finkelgrün. He's an author, a long-term journalist, and somehow a philosopher. He worked in Germany and Israel and is now living in Cologne. Okay, so after the attacks in Paris, um, which seem to be done by uh, radical Islamists, the war on terror is experiencing a severe upgrade. And there's a growing movement in the right-wing people in Germany and xenophobia and hostility towards people which are suspected to be foreigners or Muslim seems to be legit now. Did the war on terror actually help uh, or is it getting all worse? <laughs> I'll make it short. Uh, I think what we are experiencing is uh, the beginning of a new phase uh, of terror with which we are confronted and the search for ways of how to deal with it. Um, okay, Paris was a signal, uh, the signal which marked the introduction of this terror to Europe I just came back from Israel about a week ago, and uh, one of the sentences I heard on that Wednesday when news came from Paris was, uh, well, now the Europeans are experiencing what we experienced over decades. And uh, I'm afraid uh, the tendency, the trend is of that kind. What I am afraid of personally is that um, in Germany, not, not only the right-wing movements like Pegida or, or similar, uh, the moment we will have the first big terror attack in Germany, we'll face a second German autumn of the kind that we had in the 70s when you had uh, policemen with submachine guns and military and tanks on the road and whatnot, a hysterical atmosphere will all of a sudden, like a storm, come over this society? Yes, uh, I, I agree. And if I could just add to that, uh, it's too bad that Enno's not here because uh, he made a very interesting point in his own discussion earlier. And I, I made some notes on this, which is why I've got my laptop here, so I didn't forget. Uh, he raised this idea, and I've said this before in public forums as well, and I've, I've talked about this in, in other places too. He raised this idea that uh, um, ISIS or ISIL or however we're, we're uh, talking about these guys, he said that they, they have a kind of a component to the conflict where they're a bunch of idiots. And they are, there's, there's a component that are really, in English, we used to call this uh, cannon fodder, you know, people who would go to the front lines and would, that's why they're there, they're there to die, that's the whole point. Now, the, the problem for us, uh, and the, pro the well, there's all kinds of problems, but one of the well, problems for us is that um, there seems to be a strong link between and among these idiots. So what we are actually seeing is, we are seeing uh, terrorism and this particular type of terrorist activity that is, is now coming about in Europe and in part um, other parts of the world as well because it's quite similar to what has gone on in these other things in, in North America and to some extent in Australia as well. What we're seeing is we're seeing that link. So they are people who are disaffected, they are people who, are, who don't necessarily have to be uh, from one particular kind of ethnic background 
or they don't have to be from one particular kind of religious background either, because we are seeing lots of people who are converts to, you know, to this. I, I, I even hesitate to say religion. They are converts to this concept that uh, uh, ISIS is trying to push, this kind of radicalism. And so that's what this is, I think. I think what we're seeing is we're, we're allowing these kind of disaffected people, you know, who are sitting around in, in mom's basement playing video games, and then all of a sudden they realize that they are losers in society, and one way to gain back or, or try to not be a loser anymore is to get engaged in, in this kind of violence and this, sort of, uh, this sort of stuff. And it's not because of the video games, so don't, you know... <laughs> Or, 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 you know, heavy metal or something like that. Okay, thanks. Uh, one, when you watch the news, you may come to the conclusion that um, crimes as murder committed by Muslims are uh, considered as terror. And uh, if it's done by some Christian or else, in most cases, considered as a lone operator or being done by some mentally disordered person. So when you watch the news. And uh, how do the governments actually divide between terrorism and crime? And is there other distinction but religion here? There's one point where, where I would place this stress a little differently. I've, in, in my lecture today, I, I pointed out that uh, what we are witnessing with ISIL is, is not a new phenomenon. Uh, we, we have it from the end of the 19th century in the Sudan uh, uh, over to the rebellion of the Wahhabite tribes in, in Saudi Arabia. And this cannon fodder um, tendency is common to all of them. And this I do believe has something to do with religion, at least with religion as understood by certain trends in Islam, uh, where offering your life for uh, Allah or whatever is the highest achievement that can happen. So there you can get uh, the, the cannon fodder and... Uh, I do believe that religion does play a stronger role than we think so far. Well, maybe, but uh, uh, then we have to be careful how we frame that because there are certainly converts to the religion. So somebody wakes up one morning and says, uh, I'm converting, and then decides, <laughs> and, and decides to convert in a particular way, right? So they're not scholars of the religion or something. No, no, no. They, they want this one... Uh, simple, single-layered thing, that piece of the religion. I mean, you find the same thing on the Christian side. Sure. Uh, yes, yes. So, uh, people who believe without having ever read the Bible. Uh, yes, of course. And, and then, then it's the problem about uh, tipping points of violence yeah. and things yeah. like that. Yeah. So, uh, uh, I, I think that uh, we are in a dangerous position with um, the way that political leaders are responding to many of these things. And I've, I've tried to, to deliver talks on this in, in different ways um, in the Australian context, as, just as an example. Uh, as far as I know, there is, on average, and going back for about five years now or something like this, on average, there's uh, one death from domestic violence every week. It's about 50. It's uh, almost 100% of the time it's women. Um, but... And in the Australian context, uh, uh, terrorism and terrorist activity don't come anywhere near, near that, right? Uh, there's something like about 1,500 deaths from traffic accidents on a uh, yearly basis. So, and, and terrorism and terrorist activity doesn't come anywhere close to that in the Australian context. And most developed countries have the same numbers, the same kinds of figures. So... Uh, this idea about terrorism and targeting a particular group and a specific set of people is a very nicely packaged, easy way for governments to uh, make an attempt to deliver their own messages. So vote for me because I'll protect you. Uh, we have a particular crisis. I mentioned this yesterday. We, you know, uh, a, a politician would very easily say we have a crisis because we have refugees. And those refugees, you know that there's going to be a lot of Muslims there, and you know what Muslims do, right? And that's the end of the message. 
And it's a very nicely packaged, easy way for them to hang on to power. Um. Uh, what uh, role does the lack of education play here on both sides? Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, this is a difficult one, isn't it? Because you always want to be positive about education, um, but it doesn't always work. So you certainly want to be positive about this and try and... But all those numbers I just cited, those figures I just cited to you, are, are you can find them easily. You know, you can just Google them, put, put them into the, you know, the Wikipedia machine and it pops out for you. So it's very easy to find these things. It's very easy for me to teach classes at universities where I tell people things. But now what? Uh, sometimes it's not enough. I mean... Uh Yesterday we had this uh, quote by Einstein at the end of the talk, and uh, it's, it's a question of what you consider education. Uh, is uh, learning innumerable facts education, or is learning to think education? I guess both. <laughs> okay, so let's change, uh, change the subject a bit. Uh, we all know those terror warnings uh, which are released by governments from time to time and they happen to be released right before elections or if some new laws, uh, laws uh, should pass the parliament which have negative effects for civil rights. Uh, how does this all make sense apart from um, manipulating the public? I mean, what is manipulating the public? We also have to speak about what experiences people or society have. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you something that struck me yesterday. Uh, I was sitting there, and there was a suitcase standing in front of me. I was looking at the suitcase, and for two or three hours, nobody came to touch the suitcase. And I thought, well, if this suitcase would be standing 3,000 kilometers away from here, the room would be empty within minutes, and the police would come and investigate what's in the suitcase. This has something to do with the experience of terror. So a society adapts itself to the experiences it makes. Okay. Yeah, yes, sure, I think that's, that's quite correct. And, and uh, um, uh, it's not simply the case. We shouldn't think about this simply as, as governments trying to manipulate people. Certainly that does happen. But uh, we also touched on this yesterday, that people, perhaps, they buy into this fear. They want mm -hmm. this whole thing to be happening. Uh, they certainly are responding to it. Uh, people are winning elections, and you don't win an election simply by you know, pressing buttons in the machine. Uh, people are responding to this, and I think that's part of the, uh, the experience. And if um, mass surveillance and collection of, uh, of data, data retention, are effective measures against terrorism, uh, why do attacks still happen? Are they really effective? That's what I ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, political violence is something that uh, I don't think we are going to get rid of. Terrorism is part of that. Uh, it, it isn't something that uh, will disappear or... or uh, uh, conflict is not something that will simply end or we'll get rid of it. It's much more complex than that. And I don't think that technologies and many of the technologies that we use are guarantees to stop this kind of terrorism. So relying on that is, is a mistake. It's a huge mistake for us to start saying if we establish better forms of identification, we will stop political violence. It, it won't happen that way. So does it make any sense to put 18 million people under suspicion by mass surveillance? Well, again, <laughs> it depends on what you want, right? It depends on what kind of society you want to live in. So maybe it does make sense. Maybe if, if that's what we want and we want complete safety, then uh, uh, every time you walk through a door, you'll have to empty your pockets and take off your shoes and do all those sorts of things, if that's the kind of society we want to live in. Yeah, I guess not. Okay. So <laughs> So, oh, I'm, I mean, I'd like to point out again, uh, we don't want it. 
And yet, I, I'm, I'm telling you, let one big terror attack take place here and people will willingly open their bags in front of every restaurant uh, or cinema and let controls take place. Uh, you can't avoid it. So this this next question was more for Enno. <laughs> okay, so which factors lead to radicalization and the consequence and in the consequence to terrorism? This is a this is a very complicated problem. Uh and as an academic I study this this complicated problem. So there's a number of things and and I don't even think we have time to go into this. Um, Enno did touch on that in, in, his, in his discussion. He did talk about this somewhat and talked about the various political factions that have broken up here and at the different levels and the different layers of, of uh, political violence that occur, not just in that region but other parts of the world. So it's quite complicated and, and uh, uh, we don't have a solution for it. Uh, unfortunately. <laughs> This, this is a question I, I've uh, been asking on, on Twitter for questions. <laughs> And uh, one was, will mass surveillance radicalize minorities because they, f because they feel even more excluded? Again, uh, the question is, which society are you talking about? Uh, if we are looking at the society here in Europe or in Western Europe, uh, Yes, uh, if you are talking about uh, the society in the Middle East, uh, things will look different again. They don't need this to get radicalized. I guess, yeah. <laughs> okay, and are there really effective measures against terrorism? Any? <laughs> Well, y yes, of course, and and again, it depends on what kind of society you want to live in. There, there are effective measures against terrorism, and there are a number of different ways to do this. If we look at this historically, and we again, we talk about uh, um, various different kinds of societies. So, because everywhere you go, there will be a different way to, uh, uh, to both frame the problem, that is, talk about terrorism, as well as frame the solution, that is, find out ways to stop political violence. So it depends on what we want in where in the place that we live in. Um, there are a number of examples that, that you could talk about. In the Canadian context, there was a uh, uh, very powerful uh, Quebec liber liberation movement, and that was stopped by a combination of appeasement and uh, showing some sort of semi-military force in, in public. So both types of, of responses, or, or if you want to say both, I mean, there are more responses, but those two kinds of responses were, were done, um, and they were effective against a particular political movement. But, of course, the difference is today, if we're thinking about this historically, the difference today is linked to what I said earlier about, about having you know, this idiot thesis, right? Uh, this is not a movement that's based on winning back particular territory or uh, this is not a movement that, that talks about um, making an attempt to uh, recreate a nation or uh, getting freedom for a particular historical nation or something like that, right? So we're talking about a particular kind of political violence and, and a particular kind of terrorism. So you would have to really situate that in a, in a very specific context because we don't have this situation. It's, here in Europe, we aren't talking about um, this is not a, a, a freedom fight, right? This is not a movement for the recapturing of a particular territory. Now, uh, ISIS is, is trying to reframe this in that way. ISIS is trying to say, uh, we want to locate the caliphate here. Um, by here, I don't mean Germany. I mean, I mean where they're saying they want to locate that caliphate uh, in parts of Iraq and that, that whole uh, territory. So they're trying to reframe this in a, in a uh, uh, modernist, nationalist discourse. And I think they're failing at that, but they, we still see the violence uh, continuing. Uh, 
I would like to add one one point to to this, uh, which is the really the difference between the phenomena in in the West, in Europe, or in Canada, for that matter, and in the Middle East. Whereas in 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 Europe or in Canada, such phenomena have an ethnical or nationalistic background. In the Middle East, you have a totally different background, and uh, this does not pertain only to the. Uh, Islamic countries, uh, it pertains also to Israel. The Middle East is dominated by society which in history has, rightly or wrongly, experienced itself as being oppressed, as being disregarded, and this is something that causes aggression which in turn produces terror. It's a totally different background. So the, the intention there is not the achievement of a nationalistic aim, but of proving yourself not to be the suppressed part. Uh, it also makes it hard to divide the good guys from the bad guys, <laughs> when uh, even in situations like a civil war in Syria or elsewhere. Yeah. Okay. So, are there questions? Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, homegrown terrorists in Germany, uh, miners which uh, went to Syria and uh, fight there and are now returning to Germany. Uh, people from up to uh, from from 14 to to 50 years old um, went for a few months or a year over to, to Syria. What should be the way with dealing with those people when they return home? Because they're like Germans. Um, there are Germans who will stay here for, for, for years, for decades. Should we like put them under surveillance? Should we like to integrate them into society, give them a new way of life? So, or uh, should we like uh, put them in prison or something? Again, I think we are just at the beginning of trying to work out ways and means of dealing with this phenomena. Well, you can be absolutely certain they will be put under surveillance, uh, provided uh, their return is registered, which we cannot be sure of ev in every case. Uh, and But otherwise, uh, whether they can be reintegrated into the society in Germany or in Belgium or wherever, uh, is, is uh, quite a different problem. And, and here we are only at the beginning of a phase. Uh there, there are specific uh, de-radicalization prog programs in Germany. Uh, there are specific de-radicalization programs in Denmark. Um, uh, Sweden has something going. Um, they're only really just starting this in, in Australia and Canada. So this, this concept, this idea of de-radicalization is something that, as, as you say, we're, we're really at the beginning of this. Uh, there, we don't know what this whole thing is leading to. We're not quite sure. Um, part, of this, part of these de-radicalization programs are based on 1970s-style cult deprogramming. That's specifically uh -huh. what they're, they're uh -huh. doing. Yeah. So it's very similar to, you know, if you, if you um, uh, think back to what was going on in the 70s and 80s, it was very popular for, and there was this kind of moral panic around this as well. It was very popular for people to join particular types of cults. Uh, most of them had nothing to do with Islam, actually. Um, they were something else entirely, a whole different dynamic. And uh, so the, the, the current state of affairs in terms of de-radicalization is based on that. I, th I think that there are some definite things that we should not be doing. So sen sending people to prison is a really bad idea. I think that's, that's probably the worst idea that you could do when you're talking about de-radicalization, uh, simply because it, it isolates people and then creates the... the perfect training ground for uh, more radicalization and a kind of increase in criminal behavior. So that's a terrible thing to do. I also think that um, if I think about this historically and, and how these things have, have operated, I also think that uh, uh, taking away people's citizenships is also a really bad idea. It's a really bad thing to do because once a government, and, and you know, we know this as, as a, I'm a political scientist and I say this all the time, uh, once a government has a policy in place, 
they feel quite free to use it for a whole bunch of different things. So the next thing you know, you're not going to fill out your tax form properly, and the government's going to say, oh, well, I, you're not being a proper citizen, and we're going to take your citizenship away. So I, I think that's a, a, a very bad road to go down when we, when we think about de-radicalization in, in those terms. Uh, so there's a couple of certain things, and the rest of it uh, is, is very uncertain when we're talking about how to deal with people and make an attempt to reintegrate them into society or something like this, because they may never have been integrated in the beginning. You know, if you're, if you're a petty drug dealer, and, uh, uh, which is what's happening with much of this radicalization, if you're kind of a petty drug dealer and you're not very happy with yourself, most of them are men who feel really, you know, uh, demasculated, and now this is a way to gain back this some kind of masculine thing about their personalities, um, they were never really integrated into society in, in the beginning, so we don't really know a lot of this stuff. Yeah, I'm, uh, I mean, uh, what we have to bear in mind, of course, is you're talking about cults, but at the same time, what we are confronted with is the confrontation of religion. Uh, so the, the principle is, uh, are we about to start to tell people what they should believe and what they should not believe? Uh, it's a very problematic uh, Cult, religion, what's the difference, yeah. can I say? Yeah, I think this was a very I don't good want to offend anybody. <laughs> a very good point you just made. Um, uh, I think the best thing to uh, fight against terrorism is not uh, to fight the terrorism, like our government is now doing, uh, but more uh, tackling the roots of terrorism, like you said. So identify why someone become a terrorist and want to move to uh, Syria or somewhere else to fight, and uh, like you said, uh, he never was integrated into uh, our society. And to uh, really take that and uh, take the roots, go to the roots and then identify it and uh, fight there against this terrorism to prevent new terrorists. That's our best way, I think. Yeah, sure. But, but uh, I'm always hesitant to, to talk about this in technocratic terms because we, we certainly can posit these... these uh, so-called solutions, but that doesn't, it, it, it's not a guarantee. And, and we can also look at it from the other side. Um, uh, as an example, a uh, number of people who are, you know, part of these biker gangs. So uh, entire chapters of these biker gangs in, from Holland and parts of Germany have decided to go to Syria to fight on the other side, of course. They want to fight with the Kurds or, or whatever they think you know, the, the Kurds or the Kurdish army is because there's, there's no such thing. It's fractured and all different, uh, different kinds of things happening there. But what do you do with those guys? Because apparently they're fighting the terrorists. Apparently they're fighting, you know, on our side. Um, do we let them go? And what happens when they come back? And all of these sorts of questions are, are around this. And then also, what do we do when we have sets of circumstances where people have dual citizenship and decide to go and fight in an army on the same side, but for a different state. So there are all of these kinds of quite complicated questions. And choosing that one side and saying this uh, single group are going to be the bad guys that we're going to define, well, it's difficult. It's a very difficult and dangerous thing. Thank you. What about state terrorism? Is there state terrorism? How do you see it? And uh, I have the feeling it is uh, state terrorism as I see it, like I say, uh, that the US government is terroristic in, in my view. Uh, would you agree with that? Or, and I, I would see it as, as the, the bigger threat to society than any uh, independent groups uh, we, we see as terrorists normally. No, I'm happy to answer that. Uh, okay, but... Um State terrorism, what, uh, if, if you look at the United States, uh, what the American government is doing in parts is breaking its own laws, trespassing over 
regulations and laws which the United States have uh, set up. Uh, but uh, I, I'd say something in favor of the United States. To my knowledge, uh, the United States so far in history was the only country that in retrospect has been able to correct the faults it had committed before without having to be vanquished by another army first. So all we can do is hope that this will happen again. Well, I'm, I'm a political scientist and state terror has a very specific definition and, and uh, uh, just like terrorism itself, they have specific definitions. So um, it's, it's not, for me, uh, it's not correct to say that the United States is, is terroristic because it's, it's a meaningless statement. So you would have to actually give me some kind of specific thing to talk about and say, what does that actually mean? Now, state terror uh, usually refers to, in, in political science terms, usually refers to a situation in which a, a state, uh, be it a legitimate state or a not legitimate state, because you can have two different kinds, and, and there's nuances between that as well, um, where you have a state that acts on its own citizens in a, in a particular way. Uh, I'm not sure I would classify the, the United States, uh, the whole thing like that. So I don't think that that fits that definition. The question about um, getting involved in, in conflicts and different types of conflicts around the world is again a different one. So uh, uh, depend, and, it, and depending on what level we are talking about, because if we're talking about simply manufacturing arms, for example, you know, the, uh, we had a discussion here about um, uh, German arms ending up in, in uh, parts of this Kurdish military. Um, the question about arms manufacturing, well, if you wanted a really loose definition of, of what a state might do to uh, enhance conflict around the world, well, they make guns. So. Uh, there are no arms manufacturers in the Middle East. Those guns come from, uh, they come from the United States, Germany, the UK, from France, uh, from these big manufacturers of arms. So at what level are we, are we talking about getting engaged in these conflicts? So there's a, this is a, uh, quite a complicated and, and problematic set of things to, to talk about. Okay, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm just trying to, to get a bit of a picture because we're, we're, we're talking about the international system, uh, uh, the, the international thing, uh, which means we have um, a certain group uh, in, in the Middle East, let's say, that's uh, using religion as a vehicle uh, to excuse their, uh, yeah, they're taking power. Let's just say it this way. Um, the thing is that over here in, in Western Europe, or let's say, in, let's just leave it with Germany, <laughs> um, we have uh, not quite that many problems. Uh, we have been told that there was a warning, whatever, but we, we never had an attack. Yeah? So I'm... Uh, I, I just get the, the impression um, that th this is used as a vehicle. Um, the fact that over there, there are people who are threatening um, to excuse um, measurements that are simply not adequate um, to keep a, a certain surveillance, um, which bears the possibility of uh, just um, yeah, controlling the life of, of almost everybody. Yeah? Um, and I... I um, yeah, it's a bit, bit difficult <laughs> to explain what, what I'm up to. Um, I just uh, can't... can't uh, yeah, I... I can't understand who, who would want that. Um, how can we want that? Um, how, how can we go that far? How can we go far enough to, to uh, ask for uh, measurements like uh, 
Oh dear, help me, Vorratsdatenspeicherung. Um, Data retention, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, vocabulary problems. Um, without, uh, yeah, a real basis. Um, and I, I just, how, how can people who, who govern us um, go and, and ask for that and ask the people who elected them for their data in, 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 that, uh, in, in such an extension? Uh, yeah. Uh, you mentioned taxes and citizenship. Uh, as a citizen of a country, I pay my taxes and I expect the government and the administration to deliver certain goods for the taxes which I'm paying. Not only disposing with garbage and building roads. One of the things the citizens want from their government is to take care that they are secure and that they are not endangered. And if something happens, they will accuse the government of not having delivered. We are paying you and why didn't you do something to prevent this or that happening? This is one point. The second point is what you then went on to say. What means are we willing to give the government to deal with this issue, namely to secure the existence of the citizens? And here you start floating because some people will be willing to give more, some people will be willing to give less. And the wish of the government to collect data is nothing new. It didn't begin with the internet. Uh, we had it in, in former eras as well. Uh, you have to decide from phase to phase which rights the government has and should have to be able to fulfill the tasks it is confronted with and which it should not have. But this must be borne in mind. Yeah, and I think we're still debating this. Uh, we're and and not simply in a uh, it, it, not simply in a way in which um, we as citizens are debating this with our governments. We are debating this amongst ourselves. So we haven't decided in any way, and I don't think we will. I don't think there is a consensus on on uh, whether or not you know this data retention thing. Um, uh, governments around the world are doing this now already. It's done. It's finished. So. The debate that we are having around this is whether or not this is effective, uh, whether or not we, we can escape this somehow or, or something like this. But it's not a consensus among all citizens to say we don't want this. In fact, many people have argued that this is a very good idea. So I think that's the debate we, we are in the middle of. And there is no, there is no answer to this. You know, there is no clear-cut sort of uh, answer to, to your question. It's a good question, but it just we don't have an answer to it. My 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 problem is just the the, the question: where's where's the borderline? Where will it end? And that, that's something I really fear. Yes, and we're we're still this is this is what I mean. We're still arguing amongst ourselves about this, and even governments have not decided on how far they want to go. So they are arguing about it. We are we we are in the middle of this big discussion around it. And, and to tell you the, uh, honestly, I'm afraid of a clear-cut answer to this question. We have to learn to live with the uncertainty where the borders really are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there more questions? Um, all modern democracies um, have been living with terrorism and violent political actions since decades now. Um, have we seen any evolution in the way it's been perceived? Like um, compared with the, with, the, with the 70s, do we have different society uh, reactions to to those acts in the media or in 
in the um, in the governments. Um, do you see any change, or is it just always a cycle that's on repeat? No, I think certainly there is change. I, I think certainly there is, uh, not, but not necessarily a kind of linear progress where it's always getting better. But there is certainly a change. And I think it's in, in part, it is uh, really up to us to press for some kind of positive change. Uh, but each era had its own um, problems, and then each place had its own problems, and things like this. You know, uh, a great religious war that never ended was not here, it was in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And it went on and on and on forever. And the, uh, the response to that, especially by the Thatcher government, the response to that, that kind of heavy-handed response to send in troops and then start uh, indiscriminately jailing people and doing this sort of thing was a, a catastrophic failure. It got nowhere. In fact, it, it exacerbated the problem and entrenched the problem. It made sure it guaranteed that there would always be fighting there until uh, both sides decided, without the armed forces, until both sides then decided, well, we can't continue this because we're just, this is suicide now. Uh, we're going to kill ourselves. So they, they laid down their arms and did all this stuff. Now, if we use that as a parallel and we think about this and, and how the, this, uh, this went on, um, it's not quite correct to say it's a religious war because you had people on, the, uh, on one particular side of it, and it doesn't even matter what side. You had people on one particular side of it who said, well, um, these are the, this is how the religion was constructed in the past, and I think I'm going to kind of make up my own version of this. And I'll make up my... And this is, you know, Ian Paisley did this. He just made up his own rules and said, this is what this version of Irish Protestantism is going to look like now. These are what the modern rules are now. I'm going to make this up, and then we're, this is the direction we're going to go, and we will violently oppose... Uh, any sort of union and, and any sort of uh, encroachment of Catholicism, right? So he entrenches this kind of stuff. Now, this is obviously, this dynamic is obviously a, uh, a power grab. It's obviously about power. It's not about God coming down and, and uh, telling him, you know, this is what you have to do. Uh, well, he may have thought that he had visions of Christ. I don't know. But uh, uh, it is clearly a power grab. So when we look at terrorism and we look at how political violence operates in these different contexts, they do have their own characteristics and I think there are things that we can learn from them. Um, whether or not this, they, they apply to you know, our current problems today and things like that, those are things that we have to, we have to discuss and talk about and analyze and, and that sort of a thing. So uh, it's quite difficult and uh, I talk to policymakers quite often, and they don't really like talking to me uh, because I can't give them a clear answer. Like, I can't say these are the three things you need to do, point A, B, and C, because it is a very complicated set of problems and issues. But, but it, in short, the answer is, is uh, yes, there are things that we can probably learn from the past. Whether or not they apply to current problems is another issue and whether or not we can actually apply them to create some kind of you know, positive end to all of this uh, is another issue again, and I don't know. I don't know if that's, that's possible. Okay, so are there more questions? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I want to ask, do you have examples? I mean, do, you, we, do we know of things that a certain state, I mean, I was thinking of Israel or France or places or Spain that have, have re um, repeated attacks that, is, uh, that shows that they have learned from some of the things that happened? Um, maybe some just enhance their um, security capacities. Maybe some, uh, like Denmark, uh, invested in more programs to rehabilitate those people. Do we know of some kind of historical evolution in the responses to terrorism? Well, <clears throat> Israel is perhaps a good example because you can observe a development of a considerable period of time. Uh, personally, I think uh, you can register an increase of, uh, I wouldn't say oppressive methods, but, 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 uh, I mean, build, building a wall and, and, and using all kinds of static 
uh, methods to contain uh, terror is one possibility. Uh, for example, you had a um, couple of two or three months ago a series of uh, terror attacks by Palestinians driving cars into uh, groups of people waiting at a bus station. What happened? Three days later, all bus stations were surrounded by big bricks of, uh, of stone to prevent the cars crashing into, into. So, uh, of course, you can do that, but that's something that um, limits the normalcy of, a, of normal day life. Uh, uh, otherwise, the development of technology, techniques, I mean, uh, Again, you invent something and then it's a question, what do you use it for? Uh, Elbit today is probably the firm uh, which has the greatest experience uh, in uh, manning drones, uh, even to the extent that NATO countries are, are using Elbit as a subcontractor for, for, for activities. Uh, but all these are measures which uh, decrease the normalcy of day-to-day -day life. Uh, I don't see any other venue at the moment. If, if we look at this again, if we do this thing where we look at this in, in terms of uh, historically, then the, the, sh the answer is yes, there are successes. So in the Quebec case, for example, uh, the, the process that goes on there is the result of something called the Quiet Revolution, the Quiet Revolution comes about in the 1950s when you see uh, an entire society that wants to um, uh, create, uh, recreate itself and, and wants to have a, a situation where it is in a national construct where they have their, their language recognized, their minority language, but they, have the, they want the language recognized as a national language at a national level. Um, uh, they want to... Uh, get away from having the Catholic Church control the education structures, so they want to be free of this sort of thing, uh, and, and, and other things. So the, the, this is part of this kind of cultural revolution that goes on, the quiet revolution that they talked about um, uh, in the 1950s. Now, uh, because it was proceeding too slow for people to be happy with it, part of what happened is a violent wing appears, and which becomes terroristic, uh, blows up bombs, and, and does these sorts of things. Now, Part of the response, not the entire response, but part of the response of the government at the federal level was to then go back to this and say, well, maybe this is, uh, maybe they have legitimate concerns. Maybe their concerns ought to be treated as, as serious concerns. Maybe we should make this language as a, uh, uh, an official language along with English. Maybe we should be doing something else here where um, we need to rethink the status of the states that have created the federation. So maybe we need to, to uh, make a special case for Quebec. So this kind of a stuff that, that went on um, eventually takes away the argument of the terrorists. So the terrorists, the violent wing of the, FL, of, of, um, the actual liberation movement, so the FLQ, which was the violent wing of that, that liberation movement, uh, it takes away their argument. So their support really falls away because people no longer see the need for that particular violent wing. Now, that's a, that's a special case, and, but I think we can learn from that. So that is a special case, but we can learn how to respond to, to uh, uh, these sorts of acts of aggression and try and figure out why they are there. So that's, that's, you know, that's, that's what I do as an analyst. That, that, that's the kind of stuff that I do, to try and figure out why those political violent things happen. Um, and if, if I respond to what you've just said a little bit, uh, we also know, we know a couple of other things. We know that um, creating those sort of static responses like building a wall makes the wall a target. So the wall will always be a target. Whereas there is no target anymore in the Quebec case, you know, in this, this context, because uh, the lang the the, the demands, effectively, the demands of the terrorists, which is not really the right way to say that, but effectively the demands of the terrorists have already been met. So there are no more demands of the terrorists, you know, in this, this Quebec context. Uh, but the wall is a target, forever. 
It, it varies, of course, from conflict to conflict. Yes, uh, very I much. mean, if, if we take the Gaza Strip, uh, we had first the demand for the withdrawal of, of Israeli occupation. Uh, then this demand was met. Israel withdrew, and the result was terror increased. Uh, so it, it's sometimes not easy to find what is the real basic uh, reason for the aggressions which erupt. Okay. And I have another um, question about surveillance, because I think um, uh, one really um, um, a threat is because um, now we are uh, focusing on um, observing 80 million people, and most of them have nothing to hide. And um, I think uh, if we focus on, the, on, on mass surveillance, I think we will lose um, the focus on the real threat, um, people that are able and have the possibilities and uh, capabil capabilities to um, avoid the surveillance. And I think um, this might uh, lead even more to, um, to a, um, to a threat because um, we can't, uh, um, we we are losing focus on the on, on terrorists because uh, we uh, have mass surveillance and this will help people. This will help um, terrorists to um, make their plans because uh, we do we we think okay we have surveillance it's all um, it's all good and we will see if something comes up. Would you say it's um, this might even? Um, would you say this um, this might be uh, um, this might be true? Well, everyone's got something to hide, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yes. Bes be besides, because, um, because I think um, um, minorities uh, surely will be affected of mass surveillance and. Um, it will affect people, even if they say they don't have anything to hide. But um, I think another threat is that uh, you lose the focus on the real terrorists because you spend um, money and you spend personal and um, you even say, oh, um, look, um, the government says, hey, people, look, um, it's, uh, it's good, we are, um, we are watching everything. And if something happens, they they can argue that they uh, say oh, we did enough we did as, as much as we c as we could and i think it's um it's a uh, it's bad to focus on um these this um this ausrede this um this this excuse uh, as you were speaking i i, I remembered um wanting to know what the population does is nothing new. Uh, it starts with Metternich and Fouché, and if you look through the archives of the Gestapo, you can find that the phenomenon of the unofficial uh, collaborator who hands in weekly reports about what his neighbors are saying uh, has existed then, it existed then in the German Democratic Republic. Uh, no doubt it exists today. You don't need this, you have today technical methods. So the, 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 uh, the wish of whoever is in power to be informed is limitless. And it will go on being limitless. Uh, the interesting phenomenon for me is that uh, our fear today takes place in a period where we are freer than German society ever was. It appears to be a contradiction, but I, I think it's right, and we have to live with this conflict of knowing that collecting information, which to a certain extent is also the task of a government, can be misused, and we must ask ourselves, how can we control the government which tries to control the information about us? And of course, the other part of that is—is is I, I, I agree with what you've said—and and the other part of that is—is is that uh, uh, it's also a private capital that has access to the same data. They just buy it from the government, 
and in in some cases it's even it's even more than that i mean it, the relationship is is even more complicated because of course governments uh, um, will often uh, farm out many of their services right so it's it's no longer the case that that governments around the world uh, control these various services and then those services are, are accountable to us as citizens. That's, that's not how it operates. So in some cases, uh, like in the Australian case, the uh, parliamentary security complex is not run by the government itself. It's run by a private company. And it's not run by one private company, but that private company has changed over time. And in, in some instances, they've sold the data on. So they've had big chunks of data. They knew all the uh, details of members of parliament. And they went and sold it. So this, this kind of thing, this kind of phenomenon is, uh, is with us. Um, there's nothing we can do about it. But, um, well, I mean, we, I think as, as citizens of wherever we are, I think it is partially our duty to, to press against this and to demand something else. But uh, I do think, and given what I've seen in the past uh, in, in terms of these developments in the past five or six years, you know, very recent stuff, uh, I do think you're right. I do think that it is a distraction, and I do think that um, it is very much like, like my wall metaphor. You know, building a wall ma makes it a target. Uh, creating these kinds of surveillance structures actually makes them a target. And so we, we do two things here. We don't necessarily catch any of the, the terrorists that we're really worried about. We do have a... a nice little security theater that goes on that, that is supposed to demonstrate that governments are doing something, uh, but they're not necessarily catching the bad guys. And by setting up a, a particular type of, of structure, this sort of surveillance system, then it is, that's the target. And so it is like the wall. So now people are going after that as a particular target. So it's an interesting uh, and in a way quite terrifying phenomenon. Uh, I mean, there's another uh, factor to it as well. Uh, in, in the recent terror attack in, in Paris, uh, we have learned afterwards that the security agencies did have information on those who perpetrated the act. But apparently they have not been able to connect the information they had. So it's a, it's a question of efficiency in quite a different field. I mean, you can be very efficient in collecting data, which doesn't guarantee that you are efficient in dealing with it. And, and they were radicalized in jail. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, are there more questions? <laughs> so I have one myself. Um, you've said in uh, Quebec um, it was an um, extraordinary situation. We had the same situation in uh, Europe and Italy and with South Tyrol where, we, where they gained autonomy by um, uh, effectively by terrorism. So um, what you're saying is if, um, terrorism is an effective tactic for um, in a, in a democratic society, if you want to reach a political goal, you have to get a radical arm, and um, that radical arm has to use terrorism to uh, to gain that goal. Is this well, it's it's an interesting question. Uh, in some cases, yes, and in some cases, no. So, in some cases, uh, yes, it is effective, but uh, of course, uh, in some cases, not. So this, the situation with the Basques, for example, is probably a better example because uh, uh, Basque separatists have, have, been, have had this radical wing and violent wing for quite some time, um, but haven't been successful in creating a state that's completely independent. Now, there are a bunch of historical reasons for this. So, um, uh, you know, they were under a, a, a particular kind of fascism and in you know, that dynamic created something else entirely. Uh, and then once they get out of that, that particular kind of fascism and move into something else and still press for this particular type of independence, the democratic state then starts to, uh, uh, you know, release the bounds a little bit and, and create different kinds of mechanisms for that. But uh, this has always been the question, in, certainly in the modern period, this uh, has been the question about... Uh, using violence, using force, and using political violence in, in some way, shape, or form to uh, create change. And, and 
this will not go away. This, you know, I've been saying this before. This is not going to go away. In some cases, yes, it has been quite effective. You know, I under the uh, apartheid regime in South Africa, they dismantled the state and had to kind of rebuild it after that. And that was done through, through a violent wing of resistance as well. Um, there are many examples of this. And in some cases, there are examples of, of you know, complete failure where, where it cannot happen and the whole thing falls apart. So it's much more complicated than saying, um, yes, terrorism works, or no, terrorism doesn't work. It really depends on these, these sets of, you know, I teach a co whole course on this. I mean, that, that's, that's what we do when we talk about this. And, and the, one of the conclusions of that course is to say that sometimes it, it has been actually quite effective to use political violence, but in other, other cases, other sets of circumstances, no, not at all. Um, I want to go back to the um, surveillance being the new wall, the new target. Um, I would like to hear your thoughts on, on, on one thing that's happening. Basically, with the introduction of such a well-known surveillance system all over the, um, the Western world especially, we are driving more and more resources, more and more individuals towards fighting it. So more and more people with actual knowledge of software, more and more projects are just spending the whole time trying to find solutions to help us, every one of us, fight this system. Um, which is, in my view, good development, but there's an interesting side to this. Um, I don't know if you know of the Freenet project, which is basically creating a parallel internet where unless you are so stupid to give yourself away, you won't ever be found and your content won't ever disappear. So this is a fantastic haven for terrorists maybe, but also for some other undesirable groups. And this is one, I'm surprised we haven't mentioned that uh, group because it's a group that's always been mentioned if we want to fight terrorism. Usually we also want to find uh, child molesters at the same time. Uh, this is the second greatest excuse for surveillance. Um, so basically we are all activist funding structures and means that are definitely going to help sharing of um, criminal material to defend free speech, um, which probably is not what we want in the first place. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. I, I, I don't know. I can only make it very short. It, it just goes to show that there's no clear-cut answer to any of the issues that we are talking about. Uh, you will always have two sides to it and uh, it simply depends on the individual decision how one goes about the issue. When I start working in the internet, will I use it that way or that way? This is a, an individual decision and individual responsibility. And you cannot uh, handle it by declaring and giving rules how to abide. Yeah, I agree. I think this this is, uh, again, it's uh, linked to my previous point that uh, uh, we haven't made a kind of a consensus around any of these things at all. Uh, we haven't even managed to make a consensus around who, who the terrorists are. So it's this, this is one of these things where uh, I, I don't even think we're close to having that kind of consensus at all. And we're still debating it and discussing it. And a consensus might prove rather problematic. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, consensus <laughs> is, is not, nece not necessarily a good thing at all. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I, I would say that, you know, as a political scientist, I would say that uh, politics is, is really about managing dissensus, not about uh, uh, creating some sort of space where we all agree. Uh, I don't want to see a society like that at all. I don't want to agree with everybody. Uh, it has to be about managing some kind of, of, of dissensus that we, we live with. And living with that uncertainty is, is uh, what it is that our political systems and political processes are, are really meant to manage and deal with. And it becomes dangerous when they say, we have a consensus, we know what we're going to do, we're very certain, and we're drawing the line here. Okay. I think that's when it becomes really, really dangerous. Okay, are there more questions? Nadine? Um, the thing you said about dissent, and uh, in a free society uh, we are able and willing to dissent about things. 
and those intelligent bastards, which terrorists are because they are able to adapt to more complexity, just want to get to a simple stage where everyone is consent with each other. I think that's the whole problem about, about terrorism. They want to keep it simple. We fully agree. There is absolute consensus. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> okay, so are there more questions? Okay, so uh, we're finished. <laughs> okay, so we will have a little rearrangement of the stage now and then come to the conclusion of this conference. You may get some. Thank you. I've heard rumors that there's cake outside, so hurry up. <laughs>